All right, so welcome everyone. Um, so welcome to the Advanced Land Cover Prediction and Habitat Assessment Program webinar, or um, I guess the acronym is ALPHA. Uh, so the presenters today will be myself, Evan Delancey, um, Jahan Karieva, she will not be presenting today, but she helped put together the present presentation, and Alex, we are here at the U of A. Uh, I'll also mention the other team members working on this. Uh, that's Jen Hurd at the U of C and Liam here at the U of A. And also a shout out to Brett Campbell, who's doing uh, a lot of the uh, alpha communications for this work. So we will go ahead and get into it. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me well and is seeing everything pretty well. If uh, you have any questions, uh, you should be able to type in a question. We should also be able to unmute you and you can put up your hand. So just let us know here if you have any connectivity issues or sound issues or visual display issues really. All right, so I'm just gonna get into an outline. So this should be about maybe 40 minute presentation. Um, if you're only interested in certain areas, then just feel free to tune in for those, but we would encourage you to stay for it all. So just, I guess, some housekeeping. So we're going to run this as feel free to ask a question at any time. We don't really want to have it all at the end. We want a lot of questions in, but feel free to raise your hand or ask a question uh, during the slide, and then hopefully we can discuss it there, maybe unmute and then discuss that there. Um, so yeah, type a question or has to be unmuted if you want to uh, use your microphone to tune in. So part one pretty much is going to be what is this alpha program that the uh, the ABMI has been working on for I mean year, uh, two years. Uh, so it's going to be an intro to what it is, what we do, what our goals are. Then we're going to get into kind of one of the data types that the alpha program produces, which is pretty much static land cover mapping. So that's our static land cover inventories, land cover classifications across Alberta. Then the second step or the second kind of data type or the second prong of the alpha, alpha program or the second and third are really land cover monitoring. So since we are the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, we really want to not just map land cover, but monitor this. So it means monitoring uh, historically, so long-term land cover trends, and really monitoring land cover in real time. We'll then get into how we can actually use the Alpha program for real-world applications. So this is gonna be mainly in the form of two case studies. So a disturbed fen uh, or a fen that was disturbed by a road. You can see how the ELF program can monitor this. And the other one is going to be uh, using Earth observation to model a yellow rail abundance. And then lastly, we should have maybe 20 minutes for uh, questions at the end, uh, conclusions, take home messages. So that's it, uh, it's kind of color coded here, so you'll know what section you are on by the color of the slides pretty much. All right, so we'll get into it. So alpha, uh, what is it? So as I said before, it stands for the Advanced Land Cover Prediction and Habitat Assessment Program. Really what it comes down to is using earth observation and spatial data science to answer questions we have about a bird's landscape. So that's, I mean, pretty broad, but I mean, we can ask pretty broad questions. At the ABMI, we tend to ask and answer more ecological-based questions. So maybe we'll want to ask, where are all the wetlands in Alberta? That's a pretty spatial-based question. Earth observation data is pretty good at this. It can cover large areas, so it can map all of Alberta and get a prediction of where all your wetlands are. We could also ask more a time series-based question. So we could ask, how often does this prairie pothole flood? So that's a temporal question and a spatial question. And you can use the rich time series of earth observation data to answer this question as to how often this prairie pothole floods. We could also ask uh, more of a historical based question. So we could ask where are our, all our wetlands or where, what year was this harvest area cut? So this is a historical question. We can go back in time with our historical archive and see that 
these harvesters in this image right here were probably cut in 1991 or the early 90s. We could also ask uh, where underground weapons facilities are. Um, you could do this with Earth observation data. ABMI probably isn't really interested in this. We're probably interested in the first three, uh, but we could ask that question if we wanted to. So overall, what, what kind of program is this? So, I mean, it's not really necessary just an Earth observation program. It's not a GIS program. It's not a data science program. It's really combining these three disciplines and using the tools in them to answer questions about our environment. So I like to say, this is a more spatial data science program. So we're using Earth observation data, we're using GIS techniques and tools, and we're using data science methods to really answer our questions. So since Earth observation is a pretty big part of this, why are we using Earth observation data? Um, so I mean, really it's because we want consistent repeated data collection. So Earth observation, if you want to survey your site um, I don't know, daily, then Earth observation is really the way to go with this. You can even have freely available data. Uh, you can get two revisits per week at 10 meter resolution. So I think this is uh, kind of a big part of what we do. We can consistently monitor large areas of Alberta with Earth observation data. Uh, and really easy access to provincial or global scale data. So if your question is for all of Canada, for all of Alberta, or even for the whole globe, um, there shouldn't be really anything to limit you there in terms of Earth observation data. You could get data for large areas. So it's really easy access to that. And then finally, if you put those together, so you cover massive areas and you revisit those areas, say, uh, weekly. Um, that's the true power. So consistent monitoring of very large areas. So say weekly monitoring of all of Alberta. That's the true power of the Earth observation data. All right. So what are the goals of the program? Uh, one sec. I'm just gonna check. Put this on pause for one second. All right, sorry, we are back. So alpha goals. So I mean, the number one goal is really uh, provide credible land cover data for all of Alberta. So Alberta has pretty good land cover data, um, maybe AVI, GVI, these are pretty good land cover inventories. They don't necessarily, they're not spatially consistent across all of Alberta. So we really wanna go wall to wall, all of Alberta, consistent methods, consistent data to provide credible land cover data. And really we wanna focus right now on wetland areas. So I think uh, forestry or forests are mapped pretty well. Uh, wetlands are currently mapped pretty well, but it's kind of a data gap that we think can definitely be improved upon. Since we are the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, we really wanna focus on the monitoring aspect of this. So not just mapping it, but uh, kind of keeping an eye on land cover. So monitoring historical long-term trends, so in the last 30 years, and really monitoring uh, real-time changes to land cover, which can occur in, I guess, dynamic land cover classes, such as water or ones that are disturbed, like forest. I think it's very important that we want to use state of the science data and methods. So is there a new satellite that's going out uh, that can improve our data? We usually want to use that. Is there a new machine learning method that can improve our results or improve our predictions? So I think that's uh, kind of a key thing to use here and a key, a key goal of ours. And additionally, uh, really use open access data, software, and methods. So most of the data we use should be open access. Anyone can use it. All the software we're using for this is open access so anyone can redo it. And all our methods are pretty much transparent and shown. We publish our code, 
we publish in scientific literature, um, and we have all our technical documentation online. So I'm going to kind of get into the three prongs of our alpha program, or our three data types. So the first one is our static data. So this is your typical land cover classifications. So our two products for this are our predictive land cover data and our surface water inventory. So these are your land cover inventories that say where are X across all of Alberta. Another aspect of the alpha program is real-time monitoring. So in Alberta, this right now is mainly focused on real-time monitoring of water. So hydro period, how often is this area flooded or how much does this lake vary seasonally? And then once you know where water is, you can kind of get properties on that. So maybe algal blooms or water advisories. And then in the end, the goal of this is really like a dynamic surface water portal saying where surface water is and what are its attributes. And then historical area, this is really using uh, historical satellite data archive. So for this, this can be harvest area regeneration. Say it was cut in 1980, uh, how is it recovering over that 30 year period? We can do the same thing for water. So how is it changing in the last 30 years? And we can kind of relate this back to uh, changes in climate or changes in uh, land use. So now I'm gonna get into the first section. So this is gonna be our static data, our classification maps. So in the remote sensing world, I mean, I think a lot of people get asked, uh, make a map of X for me, make a map of surface water, make a map of wetlands, make a map of forest. So before we do that, I think it's really good to note um, some typical problems associated with that request. So I mean, one problem is what year do you want it for? Um, so depending on your land cover class, these can change uh, pretty quickly year to year. Uh, forestry or forest that can change year to year depending on disturbances. So what year you want it for really um, changes the results a lot of the time. Additionally, what season do you want it for? Um, so if you're asking for surface water in southern Alberta, you're going to get a completely different answer whether that is in spring or whether that is in fall. So you have to really consider the seasonality of your land cover class of interest. You also might need to consider it will be out of date in X number of years. So again, if you have a very dynamic land cover class that's changing constantly, it might be out of date in one or two years. And then is it really worth it to predict this across all of Alberta? And I think really one of the more important facts is that does Earth observation data actually have the power to map X? So you really need to be aware of the limitations of this data. So with the data right now, we have right now, maybe we can't really map nutrient poor versus nutrient rich fence. I don't think the data with we have, we can't accurately map that. So it might just end up being a coin flip pretty much as to what class that is. So that's when you really need to explore your data and see what you actually have the power to map. So right now we're gonna get into one of the first products we produce. So this is what's called the Predictive Land Cover Layer 2.1. I will slowly be updating it, uh, 2.2, 3.0. So right now it covers about 75% of Alberta. It's at 10 meter resolution. In the Boreal, we have six land cover classes. So we have four wetland classes, bog, fen, swamp, marsh, additionally with open water and upland. And in the foothills and Rocky Mountains, uh, we have three classes there, open water, upland, and wetland, but we have this uh, in a probabilistic form so we can see uh, probability of wetland there. We also have probability of wetland for the, uh, the boreal, but um, we just choose to show more classes here. So if you want to see more about that work, uh, I definitely encourage you to look at uh, Jen Hurd's publication uh, in remote sensing that will kind of explain the start of our wetland mapping in the boreal, um, how we go about it, technical methods, and reasons for it. So now I'm going to kind of get into the technical details of how we produce this data. So step one is getting optical data. So this is mainly in the form of Sentinel-2 data. We also use Landsat, but I mean the 10 meter resolution of Sentinel-2 um, really makes it better for our product. 
So this is really to get information on vegetation type, uh, vegetation productivity. So we produce a bunch of vegetation indices, uh, brightness measures, stuff like that. So and then we also use synthetic aperture radar. Um, we have used radar set two, but we're mainly using Sentinel-1, and this is used for essentially the rich time series it brings. While you can get differing information about, um, sorry, we have our one question coming up. Um, so, so just curious, what are the classes for the boreal? Thanks for the first question. Uh, classes for the boreal can be seen in the bottom of this map. So we have open water, bog, swamp, fen, marsh, and upland. So we just really have general one upland class. That upland can be divided into really like human footprint. So farms are also upland in here. Uh, so we're mainly focused on the wetland class and open water. So that's what we have available now. Of course, we try to hopefully keep improving that. So maybe uh, forestry or forest in the future and forest type. So thank you for the first question. So I was at Synthetic Aperture Radar. Um, so for that, I mean, this is using the rich time series of data here. So the differing backscatter information, different vegetation types can be valuable, but usually optical data is better for that. So we're really using this for temporal information. So different land cover classes have different temporal um, characteristics. So marshes are seasonally flooded. Uh, different wetland classes have different temporal dynamics. So it's really used for the temporal aspect here. And then our last input is topographic derivatives. So this is a lot of Liam's work. Uh, he does this in Saga. So essentially it's taking a digital elevation model and then running a bunch of topographic indices on this. So for example, topographic wetness, uh, we would essentially model dumping water onto this DEM down here and then seeing where water would pool. So if we do that, chances are water would pool in this flat depression here, and that's probably going to be our wetland. For the image on the right, that is valley bottom flatness. So for this one, it's really capturing those giant flat valleys in the boreal, and this is a really good indication of where peatlands would form. Um, these are going to be very wet, wide valleys. Uh, the localized depressions um, might come out wet in the topographic wetness index, but won't come out as very wet or won't come out as very flat, uh, flat valley bottom um, in this valley bottom uh, flatness indicator. So yeah, this is a very good indication of peatland and fen formation, certainly in the boreal. Not really great in the south as um, as wetlands don't really form in these giant valleys. So we have a next question um, from Dan. So what is the DEM you use? So we use a variety of DEMs, I would uh, say. So we use, for certain purposes, we're using uh, the ELOS and SRTM DEM. Uh, these are open access, so we can publish our data. Uh, if we're producing some stuff for the government of Alberta, um, we'll use their LiDAR DEM, but that's only really shareable and uh, for BMF work. And then from Stuart we have, is the figure on the right inverted uh, in terms of high and low? Um, no, I think that's the normal DEM. So the brown should be high values and the darker green should be lower values. Uh, hopefully the 3D shows up pretty well in there, but you should be able to see the uh, low valley in there where we should expect to see our wetland. All right, next slide, thank you for the questions. So after we have all our input data, a really important step is our data exploration. So do we have the power to map um, our land cover classes of interest? So for this example, you see moving on the right, um, we see orange points as upland, blue points as open water, and green points as wetland or wetlands. So for this, we're seeing kind of clustering of three classes here. The y-axis is essentially the topographic domain. So in the topographic domain, we can really separate uplands from open water and wetlands. 
we can't really separate open water and wetlands on the topographic domain. So to do that, we essentially have to use temporal domain. So this is the Z and X axis. So on these axes, we can really differentiate open water from wetlands because wetlands will have a high seasonality or a high change over time. And open water, I think you can kind of see that is really clustered around the zero change over time. So from say spring to fall, open water is not changing. So when you use topographic domain, temporal domains, we can really um, kind of cluster these three classes and then we should have pretty good power to predict these over the landscape. And we had another question from Stuart. Um, yes, on the right side of the screen, they kind of inverted. Well, high values of valley bottom flatness uh, should be the white in this. So that should be areas. So they're kind of inverted from, uh, from the image on the left. So as a counter example as to really good separability of classes, on the bottom left, we have our uh, topographic wetness uh, for four wetland types in the boreal. As you can see here, these are violin plots. The distribution of each of these classes um, are pretty much the same for this indicator, for this topographic indicator. So bog and fen almost look identical. Marsh looks a little different in that, and swamp kind of looks, again, identical to those ones. So, I mean, this just shows, goes to show certain classes you can't predict as well, certain ones you can. I mean, certainly there's other indicators that might help differentiate fen and bog, but in some cases you'll have an easy time, in some cases you'll have a hard time. All right, and then when we are, after we're done exploring our data, uh, we're pretty much going to do machine learning. So we're going to throw our input earth observation data in there. We're going to put our topographic data in there, our Sentinel-1 data, our Sentinel-2 data, and we're going to train it with, with our ABMI land cover photo plots. So our photo plots, that's essentially a team of photo interpreters making really accurate maps of land cover that we can train our data to. And then what do we get? So I'm going to go through this data set and show some interesting wetland areas. So a lot of people are familiar with this one, Peace Athabasca Delta. So this is uh, essentially one giant wetland. Um, so it's predicting, of course, a lot of marsh, which we'd expect there, um, small upland fingers where the river valley is, and then a decent amount of fen. I don't know how accurate that is, but I think we should definitely expect to see a lot of marsh there. And then west of Lake Clare, you can see those interesting parallel ridges of upland and then a whole lot of fen. All right, so we're getting a few questions coming in from Brad. Uh, could you please tell us uh, the name of the DMs you're using due to the topographic indicator analysis with? Uh, so we're mainly using, back here. So we're mainly using ALOS and SRTM, and sometimes we're using a LiDAR DEM, and then we're producing indicators such as topographic wetness, valley bottom flatness, topographic position, uh, other aspects like that. And then we're getting a machine learning question uh, from Barry. So what type of machine learning algorithms are you using? I thought that would probably come up. So we're using a lot of them really. So Boosted regression trees is in a lot of our documentation now. Um, the latest version of predictive land cover 2.1 is done with a uh, machine learning called XGBoost. Um, and Alex in his work is using random forest algorithms. And additional is some work, uh, we're trying to get into deep learning, not just shallow learning. So for us, John Sims is really using uh, neural networks to try to do the same prediction that we're doing. So theoretically, the uh, the deep learning should be better, but I mean, this is kind of an untested area. Thank you for those questions. All right, getting into another area. So we have the Stony Mountains. Uh, so you can see the upland ridge here. That's fairly productive upland forest. And then we have the plateau at the top, which really contains lots of uh, peatlands, lots of bogs there, some fen and sprinkled in with some water. 
And then final example I'll show you near Calling Lake. This area is pretty interesting. We can see those parallel ridges of upland um, indicating our model is getting the topography well. And then it's kind of constraining those big peatland complexes in there, um, seeing lots of fen, lots of bog in there. All right, now I'll pass it off to Alex for a bit uh, to go over his Southern Wetlands work. Okay, thank you very much, Evan. Um, yeah, um, for the South, um, we have lots of um, seasonal dynamics being captured in the um, wetland region. And what we've um, actually um, embarked upon is trying to explore um, the seasonal variability, the dynamics of seasonal variability um, as a tool or an information source for distinguishing wetlands from other land cover classes. Um, the key thing to note in this is that the behavior of wetlands in the south is very different from what we have up in the boreal and hence different um, input variables are required um, to this end. Um, what we've been doing is utilizing both optical information fused with um, radar data and topographic variables to distinguish um, wetlands from other land cover classes. And a key, um, a key approach to doing this is ensuring we take our time to um, utilize the variability in seasonal dynamics um, within the wetlands. Um, like a good example is um, the state of the wetland, say um, in spring is very different from what you have in fall. So hence what we've been doing is trying to introduce such dynamics as some um, valuable input into uh, mapping wetlands um, and um, other features within the south. Um, it's quite interesting and um, from the um, slide that we have there, um, you have um, just an example of um, a work in progress and um, we should definitely um, give you a heads up as we walk along on this task. Yeah. Good. Okay, so I think that's a good transition into our next section. So since Alex really highlighted the need for, I don't know, dynamic and capturing seasonal variability, uh, that kind of gets into our next section on really real-time monitoring. So we have one question, uh, Matthew. So what resolution are the outputs? So pretty much all outputs we're producing right now are at 10 meter resolution. So this is 10 meter resolution because our Sentinel one and two data, which are our main data sources are gonna be at 10, 10 meter resolution. Um, in some cases, our DMs are 30 meter resolution. We can resample those, we're kind of limited in that. Um, when we are using a uh, LiDAR DEM for specific government work, um, we have access to a one meter DEM, um, but again, we're gonna resample that up to 10 to match our Sentinel data. So yeah, that are the that's the resolution of our product. So 10 meters across the whole province, or for some cases, 75% of the province. So yeah, we'll get into kind of the real time data and the historical data. So yeah, as Alex said, really capturing the seasonal dynamics of wetlands in the south is what differentiates, say, open water from wetlands. So we really need the ability to monitor these seasonal changes, which can change in a matter of weeks. So I mean, really static land cover mapping has been done for a while. Um, has an extremely established process, so you could always download a Landsat image, you could run machine learning on it, and you could get a uh, land cover class of interest. But recently, new technologies have really allowed us to, to do this process in near real time or analyze long-term trends to the landscape. So essentially we can do land cover classifications or land cover analysis on massive stacks of data, not single images. So we can do it on, I don't know, like 5,000 images rather than one single image. So this gives us a lot more power. So, I mean, a lot of this is done through Google Earth Engine. So this is a uh, cloud computing platform accessible to anyone really that hosts these massive satellite uh, data streams. 
So a lot of this data is from Copernicus, the European Space Agency. This is our Sentinel-1 and 2 data. This is really our real-time data stream. So maybe two images per week uh, for all of Alberta. So we'll have full coverage of Alberta at least once a week with optical data, if it's cloud-free, and then with radar data, uh, we will have um, additionally always imagery for Alberta pretty much every week, and it doesn't really matter if there's clouds or not. So I think now we can really ask and answer way more questions than before. We can ask really large scale questions about how our environment is changing uh, historically, how it's changing in real time. So this opens up a new window for um, more questions to ask, more questions to answer. Um, so we have one more question up there. Uh, that's a little longer one, so I'll take that one at the end, if you don't mind. Um, and yeah, we'll definitely take that one at the end, uh, and we'll note that one to answer. Yeah, if we don't answer that, then definitely ask that again. And one more question, has AP expressed interest in using Alpha to update the Alberta Merge wetland inventory? Um, I think some talks, so it's being used in a draft of, of the biodiversity management framework uh, for delineating fen and delineating wetlands. So, I mean, I think it needs to go through, it's pretty new, so it needs to go through some evaluation. Uh, so we certainly encourage people to evaluate it for actual use in the boreal and how good it is at delineating those wetland classes. We have our data to validate it with, but I think we need other people to validate that data. All right, so as I've mentioned before, our real-time work is really uh, based a lot around surface water, since this is incredibly variable in Alberta seasonally. So a lot of this work is working with Brian Briscoe and his team at CCRS. So to monitor surface water in real time, you really need to use SAR data here. You can do it with optical data, but since there's always clouds, and since it's nighttime a lot of the time, um, you're not going to get the good data. So SAR data, you'll always get data. You can see where surface water is. So in this example here, this is a project we're working on with CCRS using a pair of ascending and descending images to really improve your dynamic surface water detection. So I guess the uh, goal here is if you have a pair of SAR images or radar set two images, you can kind of combine the information from these to really improve your surface water mass, which they could then be used in a dynamic surface water map. So the first image is really the original water mass. That's a thresholded Radar Sat 2 image. It does a pretty good job at capturing surface water, but you can see a lot of speckle on there. Um, you can see some errors. So those errors are really associated with uh, the geometry of the SAR sensor, so some shading in those areas. If you combine uh, the geometries of an ascending and descending image, you can really get a I think better and more accurate surface water mass. So the goal of this is to combine two images. Every time you have two images go over your area, you can get a surface water mass, and then you can really capture the seasonality of water. We have also tried to do this with uh, Sentinel-1 data. So this one is our attempt at hydro period. So this is mapping surface water or time series surface water across all of Alberta. So this is essentially the same thing uh, thresholding Sentinel-1 imagery, not using an ascending-descending pair to see how often the surface water is in this given 10-meter pixel. So this can capture variation in lake level throughout the year, or this can really capture um, hydro period of wetlands in the south. Of course, Sentinel-1 isn't quite as good as Radarsat-2 for actually capturing surface water mass, uh, but it still does a decent job, certainly better in forested areas. All right, so then when we know where surface water is, we can kind of get the properties of it. So this example here is in Pigeon Lake, um, and we can see an algal bloom in uh, mid-October, uh, pretty intense one actually, uh, appear pretty rapidly, um, change and then disappear. So we want to use this real-time optical data to capture where these algal blooms are, uh, how often they occur. So this is something you can do with Sentinel-2, um, so once you have where water is, it's a natural process pretty much to follow to uh, what the properties of that water are. 
So now I'll get into a little bit of the historical data. So this is Jen Hurd's work at the U of C. So this is about harvest area regeneration. Not necessarily on the ground regeneration or recovery of harvest areas, but what we can measure from remote sensing based metrics. So for this, you're using the Landsat Historical Archive, so about 30 years of data. You're getting the annual composite image stack, so that's probably at least 30 images right there for your given harvest area, and then you're gonna plot out your recovery chart. So you can get when this harvest area was cut. Um, sometimes this differs from what was cut, or what is expressed in some of the uh, spatial data out there, so we can change this. And you can pretty much just get the remote sensing derived recovery rate, whether that's 6% uh, per year, 12% per year, that's gonna vary depending on the harvest area. So for this, uh, we've built a web application for this. So for this, you take your stack of Landsat data um, and then you're gonna plot your recovery curve. So you can really click on any of these land cover polygons. These are from the ABMI's human footprint inventory and you can get your recovery chart. So I'll play this here. So this is an inter interactive web application which you can use to uh, see which harvest areas and how they're regenerating. So you click on it here. So this one is the results aren't pre-canned. So every time you click on one, it's calling essentially the whole Landsat archive for that polygon. So I mean, terabytes of data, it's removing clouds, and it's calculating your index. So you can see it waiting. I mean, it takes 10 seconds, but it's a lot of data. And then we can see recovery curve when it's cut and how it's recovering. We can just click on another one. It will generate the chart. So each time you're doing that, it's calling the algorithm. It's calling the entire Landsat archive and then generating the recovery chart. So this is something we really want to scale up for, I mean, all human footprint features that cover in the ABMI's human footprint inventory. So wait a bit there, yeah, you can see it's cut in 1998 and then slowly recovering. So next, uh, so a trend here, you can see our historical data is really hosted in Earth Engine web applications. Since we can't download this data locally, we really need to run these algorithms on the cloud and then host that on an interactive web platform. So here, this is Miquelon Lake in the center, and we're gonna see how this lake has changed over um, the 30 plus year period. So for this data, it's essentially taking the whole historical Landsat archive for this area, uh, and then running machine learning on it. Where is water, where isn't water? So we train our model just to see where water is, and then across that whole stack of data, we're gonna say, where is water in each of those images? So then over that, you can get a long-term trend in lake area. So I'll click play on this. We're going to go through the time slider and see that this lake is shrinking quite a bit. So from 1984 to present day, we can turn off and on the transparency. And it has shrunk quite a bit. So on the top left diagram or figure there, we can really see how that lake level has changed in the past 30 years. So it's almost been cut in half. We can get a trend in that. In the bottom left, we can see surface temperature. So over that time period in this area, temperature has gone up. Precipitation has stayed pretty constant. Human footprint land use has gone up. I mean, we don't have a huge time series there. We will have uh, pretty much 2000 soon maybe to, uh, to add to this human footprint time series. So I think this can really give us, um, help us draw some broad conclusions on why lake level is changing. Is it human footprint? Is it temperature? Um, is it precipitation? So this is something that we can scale up. You can click on any lake. You can see your change in lake level. You can see your change in temperature. You can see your change in human footprint land use. This is something we're pretty excited about. All right, so now, um, We've kind of gotten into our products, so we're going to see how can we actually use this data for some real-world ecological applications. So this is one of my favorite projects. Um, so this was kind of a collaboration with uh, Caitlin Willier's master's thesis. She has uh, a bunch of ground data for this area, um, kind of observing the changes in peatlands when it was disturbed by a road. 
So we really wanted to investigate what the alpha program could do for this area. Could we map it accurately? Could we monitor this historically? Could we monitor this in real time? So we have some valuable ground data to kind of uh, ground truth our observations. So for this area, you can see a road built across a fen. So on the right, we can see a lot of dead trees. On the left, it kind of looks more like an upland habitat to me. So we see two distinct sides of this fen. Uh, we're going to observe if we can observe this disturbance caused by the road. So step one would be, do we accurately map this area as a fen and as a wetland? So if we zoom into this area, you can see the road there pretty accurately map it as a wetland. It's really high wetland probability. We can see in the topography, uh, it's pretty flat We capture the upland areas. For our predictive land cover layer, we're doing pretty well at capturing that as a fen. Uh, once it loops back, that goes a little too quickly for me. Uh, once that goes back, we can actually, on the other side of the road, it's predicting a mineral and or a marsh. This, um, while technically an air is actually an interesting problem, um, that I'll discuss more later, but it's predicting that there definitely is a fen here. So in terms of static land cover mapping, we're doing well, or accurately mapping this. So for our historical data, um, we're gonna use the Landsat Historical Archive to see when the road was constructed, uh, how did it really um, affect this fen? So you can see the road was built in 1992. We can see that going across. And we can kind of see those habitats on either side of the road, the east wetland versus the west wetland really diverge. So they look the same before. And then afterwards, they're really diverging. That uh, east wetland seems to become a more brown color and the west wetland might look more productive, might look darker green. So this is a visual interpretation, uh, but it looks as though definitely uh, we're seeing a disturbance caused by that road. So if we look at this numerically, I think this is a more uh, powerful example. We can see pre-road construction, the west wetland, which is in dark green, and the east wetland, which is in light green, look to be pretty much the same. So they're probably hydrologically connected. Uh, they don't really have any difference. They were probably the same habitat. Once the road was constructed in 1992, we kind of see that these habitats become disconnected. So the East Fen is really becoming less productive or uh, lower values of NDPI. And the West Wetland or the West Fen is maybe becoming more productive, but pretty much it doesn't look like the, uh, doesn't look like the East Wetland anymore. So the really big uh, line on here is the red line, uh, which is the difference between them. So there's almost zero difference between the wetlands um, before the road. And then after that, we see a large difference. So this is really indicating that this road um, it's causing this then to not be hydrologically connected anymore. So we also want to test our real-time monitoring. So in a lot of Caitlin's work, uh, we would expect road damming to occur in some of these fens. As fens have uh, flowing water, we would expect to see road damming on one side if it, these fens aren't in fact hydrologically connected anymore. So when this resets in May, uh, the dark blue, which is normalized uh, difference, normalized difference water index, uh, darker blues are going to indicate surface water. So when the darker blues appear, they appear in spring pretty much. So May and June, we're seeing surface water in this area. So this real-time monitoring, well, as real-time when we were doing it, or near real-time, uh, was indicating that we are seeing road damming on the east side of the road or in the east wetland. We're not really seeing it all in the uh, West Butland area. So what, what conclusions can be made from this? Um, what did the alpha products actually accomplish? So it did pretty accurately map wetland and fen in that area. As I mentioned before, there was that little error of marsh um, on the east side of the road, but I mean, I think this habitat is really transitioning to a marsh habitat now. It's no longer behaving like a fen. It has these seasonal cycles of flooding. So it's really behaving more like a marsh now. Um, and our model did pick that up well, even though it probably was a fen before. So the historical monitoring aspect, we could identify the year of road construction and we could see how this road uh, really affected or disturbed this fen. 
we can see the lower productivity occurring after row construction of the east wetland and maybe increased productivity of the west wetland. And then in a real-time monitoring, we can identify that uh, surface water flooding uh, that occurs in spring months. So, I mean, overall, approximately 2% of that area was really disturbed by the actual road construction or the actual physical road. Um, but, I mean, I think at best, 50% of this fen is actually disturbed. As you can see, the whole east wetland is pretty much disturbed while you could argue that the west, the whole west wetland is disturbed just because it's altering the hydrology. So since we're done that, uh, we'll take a few questions. Um, so we have one from, oh, we have a comment on the case study. So the model doesn't seem to take into much data pre-construction as post-construction. Um, so, I mean, we can, that's pretty much because the Landsat Historical Archive, uh, we have good data from 1984 till present day, so we couldn't capture well before that. Um, so is there any potential that the road was actually surveyed near the edge of a topographic change to avoid the peatland? Yes, that is possible. Um, looking at the topography, I don't think, I think that was just a pure flat fen there and roads built on top of that, I can't say that for sure. I think we'd have to go back into historical imagery, but definitely it may have been built there for a reason, but it did look to, it looks to have affected the hydrology of the fence, certainly. Uh, so we kind of got a general question from Dan. Um, I'll save that one for the end for sure, uh, but we'll wrap up the case study stuff here. All right, so one more case study. So this is species abundance modeling. So this is Logan McLeod's work. Um, so this is on yellow rail species abundance modeling. So typically species abundance modeling is done through, um, you model it based on habitat indicators. So one issue that I may have with this is you're doing a land cover classification saying identifying fin and then you're gonna build your species abundance model on that habitat information. So here we're kind of skipping a step. We're using straight up earth observation variables to predict yellow rail habitat. So yellow rail is really a wetland bird. It likes wetlands. It likes particular kinds of wetlands. So here we have our McClellan fen right there. So this is one giant fen. And while the yellow rail does like fen, it likes a particular type of fen. So certain types of uh, Earth observation indicators can really help us predict what type of fen this uh, bird likes. So, I mean, this in some cases can be it doesn't like flooded vegetation. It likes a very particular type of vegetation productivity, which is captured through, say, red edge inflection point. All right, so as we're wrapping up, I'm going to get into some conclusions, take home messages. So, new technologies have really allowed for easier large scale static land cover mapping. You can go onto Earth Engine, you can run a machine learning algorithm on Sentinel-2, you can get land cover classifications. But we really need to consider that land cover change, land cover is dynamic. So in this example here, uh, we have forest cover or shrubland cover in Madagascar. Each year it's changing a ton. Um, so if you ask for forest cover in that area, each year you'd get a different answer. So I think we really need to acknowledge that historical land cover change and seasonal land cover change are a big part of this. So capturing this dynamic aspects of land cover is a very important part. So after all this, what is the alpha, actual alpha system? So it is really static snapshot maps, so typical land cover inventories. And then you can combine that with information from historical earth observation, so to get your long-term trends, and then also real-time observation. So how's seasonality of your land cover class of interest changing? So really, I think this helps to get a more holistic view or more holistic data about Alberta's landscape. All right, so now that we're transitioning into questions, um, what feedback do we actually want? So this will help you get some questions here. We've already had a bunch of questions, which is awesome. 
So what are your spatial data needs? What do you want? We get a lot of requests for riparian data. Uh, what data do you actually want for your professional work or, I don't know, maybe your personal life? And can these questions actually be answered by Earth Observation Data and the Alpha Program? Feel free to ask us. Do you have any technical questions? So what topographic derivatives did we use to model wetlands? Stuff like that. Um, I'd love to actually do a technical webinar if there's interest out there, really get into the nitty gritty on uh, what we're doing in these models, what we're doing in Earth Observation and Google Earth Engine. Do you have technical suggestions? So maybe you should say we should use Alice Elban for Fenbog differentiation. Maybe we should. Uh, if you've delved into our methods at all, maybe you have suggestions as to how we can improve this. So one more thing, I just want to kind of point, point you to our product. So our data is on the ABMI website. So we should have a big dump of data coming in soon, with the uh, predictive line cover 2.1. Um, some more real-time data, maybe some web applications. So you can see all the data here. You can see all our methods, technical documentation there. We also encourage you to visit our GitHub page. Uh, where we're going to publish all our code that we do this. If you want to see Liam's uh, Saga or our Saga code to calculate topographic indicators, check that out. If you want to see our uh, boosted regression tree models, check that out. Again, there will be a big dump of data pretty soon. So I want to say thanks to kind of everyone who's worked with us. So everyone at Alberta Environment and Parks who supported this work, uh, people at Canadian Natural Resources, so specifically CCRS, uh, Brian Briscoe at team who really helped us use our use SAR data properly, and everyone at the University of Calgary, uh, Jen Hurd, Greg McDermott, who kind of got our wetland mapping off the ground. So that is it. We're wrapped up with seven minutes to spare. So in general, if you have any ecological questions you think can be answered with Earth Observation Data or Spatial Data Science, otherwise known as the Alpha Program, feel free to contact us. So our contact info is down there. So feel free to email, free feel, feel free to check out our data. And I guess now we'll take some questions. And that is it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I believe this will be posted on YouTube maybe in a few days, uh, so you can watch it again. All right, yeah, thanks, and I'll take some questions right now. So, all right, which one are we on? All right, and so one question. In your mind, uh, what could possibly be the sources of uncertainty in the alpha program? So I guess, um, I'll comment on the predictive land cover layer. So uncertainties are definitely in our wetland classes. Um, so we're pretty good at knowing where water is, where wetlands are. These form in distinct areas. When we're trying to differentiate fen from bog, I mean, really, Earth observation data doesn't have a ton of power to differentiate those classes. We think it's OK and accurate. Um, but you really need better data um, to differentiate these classes because really it's just underground groundwater flow that's differentiating these wetland classes, not stuff you can sense from Earth observation data. And generally, um, in this, there's always going to be a ton of uncertainty. On the ground, it might not be actually what you're seeing from the air. So when, with each product, you have to take a level of air into account. For line cover classes such as water, across time, we can do this pretty easily because water is a very distinct signature. But when you try to get into other classes, the air rate is certainly going to go up. All right, um, so kind of a general question. Can you speak on what uh, Google Earth Engine is and how you're using it for line cover mapping? So I think Google Earth Engine is uh, really the engine of what we're using and the products we're generating here. So for this, um, it's essentially a freely accessible uh, cloud computing platform put forth by uh, Google. It hosts all your Landsat, your Sentinel imagery, any freely available imagery, uh, and then you can process it on there. So you can do your analysis, you can do your machine learning classifications. Uh, you can essentially do everything on there. So you can access the whole Landsat archive um, and process it in a matter of seconds. So really, we're not limited by our desktop processing machine anymore. So we can do all our work on there. 
then we can export it onto the um, export it onto our local drive and see what it looks like. So I think yeah, it really works is great for a lot of our work and certainly for the real time and historical applications. Um, it couldn't be done uh, without Google Earth Engine. All right, another question. Will there be any data products that are downloadable? Yes, uh, you can visit the ABMI website. I think our data page, we have some of last year's stuff downloadable on there. So our predictive land cover data set or hydro period ones. Uh, these are all downloadable. Um, we'll definitely have some more coming up soon, but feel free to check those out. In terms of our interactive web applications, <coughs> These are not necessarily downloadable, but you can download the output and graphs from this. So say if you clicked on a harvest area, you could download the uh, harvest area recovery curve or like say the Excel spreadsheet for that harvest area. So you can't actually download the Landsat data, but you can download the outputs. All right, lots of questions coming in. Okay, for the static data, the six classes in the boreal, is that updated weekly? And is it on present imagery? So for the six classes in the Boreal, um, this one's not updated weekly. Uh, we don't expect the land cover change it, land cover uh, classes, the wetland classes to change that quickly. So this is updated probably yearly. So it may change yearly on the wetland classes. So we had one release this last March, and then we'll have one coming up, predictive land cover 2.1 coming out this March. So yeah, our static data is generally um, as in the name, it's updated yearly rather than uh, weekly. All right, more questions. Oh yes, uh, the long one. So question is posed to my half Elaine. Uh, Ducks Unlimited, <laughs> interest in knowing how each of the wetland classes are defined, fen, bog, swamps, and what variables are used to differentiate each of these classes. For example, all swamps are treed. Um, how is it classified in the predictive output? So pretty much, um, first we map wetland areas, and then we're going to map what the wetland classes in are in there. So our wetland classes are defined by our training data. So our training data is our team of photo interpreters who are going to pretty much digitize where bog is, where fen is, where swamp. So our definition is by the uh, Canadian wetland system of fen, bog, marsh, and swamp. So then we're going to train our models uh, with this data. Um, and I mean, you can see these photo plots. They're freely available on the ABMI website. Uh, if you want them, so you can see what those look like. Uh, and then we pretty much use what the best data is to di differentiate these classes. So for a lot of remote sensing data, bog and fen look pretty much the same. They're pretty much differentiated by um, their hydrological dynamics and groundwater flow. So Earth observation doesn't have a great way of uh, differentiating these, but there are some classes or some variables that can differentiate them. I think valley bottom flatness is a good one to differentiate fen from bog. Uh, red ed inflection point is a pretty good one to do, say, bog from swamp. So it's gonna really pick up on subtle differences in vegetation. All right, what questions haven't we got to? So how accurate is alpha on capturing slope fens? Uh, so that's a pretty interesting question. Uh, um, so I might not be the best uh, person to ask for this. I'm not quite sure what a slope fen is, but I'm assuming that's just a fen which has a, uh, a topographic gradient. So in that case, I wouldn't say it's amazing. I say it could probably pick up on the fen vegetation or classic fen vegetation. But if it is a true slope, uh, usually our models would not predict water pooling there. So if it's a very sloped fen, probably not capture it. If it's slightly sloped, I think it does a pretty good job of this. Um, in the case study, that's probably a somewhat sloped fen. It had clear uh, water flow from the east to the west. Um, so, I mean, I think it does a pretty good job depending on the slope. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'll definitely have to ask more um, on this slope fen um, land cover class. So another question, um, 
how do you map snow cover in ABMI? I think this is something uh, we're actually working on. We have no products on this, but essentially we can use our time series information, our real time information. Uh, snow has a pretty, pretty distinct signature. Um, so I mean, yeah, we're working on that. Keep an eye out for that, certainly. Um, so it is one right now. We probably gonna take a few more questions since there's unanswered questions. So, so smallest area, essentially, I like to say 30 meter area. So it's 10 meter pixels. Technically you can map something at 10 meters, but it has to lie perfectly in the center of the pixel. So anything above 30 meters, really, we can map. Um, question from Trevor. Uh, the resolution of this product is an obvious limitation for uh, mapping land cover at small scale. Is there any consideration to using high resolution satellite data in the future? Yeah, that is an obvious limitation. Um, you're really not going to capture. I mean, some potholes in the south are much smaller than what we can use. So yeah, we really do want to use higher resolution data. Um, <clears throat> problem for doing it for most of the province right now is uh, we really can't download individual scenes of data and do it over the whole province. Just too much processing power for the computer. So we're really limited to what's on Earth Engine and the highest resolution is 10 meters right now. So in the future, I mean, there's tons of satellites being launched. So I fully anticipate higher and higher resolution coming in the future. And right when that's available, we plan on switching to that data. Uh, and then, and then, uh, do you use the best pixel approach for land cover mapping? Yes, we do. Thanks for that question. Um, so essentially, yeah, if we're taking a annual composite, we're really using the median value. So that's an approximation on best pixel, pixel uh, assuming the high values in there are probably cloud, the low values in there are um, shadows. So we're really, kind of hopefully removing all, um, all atmospheric artifacts uh, doing that. But yeah, the best pixel approach is definitely a uh, tough problem. There's probably better ways of getting at that, but we always want to try to use the best pixel or certainly not use bad data. So a question from Mark, could your platform methods be used to analyze spatial satellite imagery? and spatial data from outside of Alberta. Yes, absolutely. Um, we don't really want to limit ourselves to Alberta. We're going to probably finish Alberta or wetland mapping in Alberta first. And then really, I think there's, since uh, scale isn't really an issue with Earth Engine anymore, we can just pretty much apply our models anywhere. If they work, great. If they don't, we'll acknowledge that. But certainly I want to think, I think we want to scale up to maybe all the boreal, boreal forest areas in Canada since those are, um, I mean, not completely similar, but very similar habitats. And we will go with the last question, I believe, uh, since we're five minutes over time. So I'll take last question. Um, which one can you highlight that one, Alex? Last one. Um, so great question. Um, I think we missed that. That should be an obvious one to answer. Um, from our end, so yeah, how did the Lancaster Wetland class predictions compare to the photo plots? So essentially this is uh, gonna be accuracy and everyone wants to know accuracy. Um, so accuracy say for, I mean, certain classes, so open water, 99% accurate. For mapping just wetlands and uplands, 85% uh, accurate to the photo plots. When we get into the land cover classes, we get lower accuracies into the say 70s. So overall for predictive land cover 2.1 in the boreal with the wetland classes, we have about 73% overall accuracy. So that's two of the three by seven photo plots. So we trained with that data and then uh, we also validated with a separate set of that data. So I think it does a fairly good job for certain land cover classes. Um, it's gonna do a worse job for others. It's gonna do a better job. So uh, last question, um, so comment, last comment um, we just saw in there. Uh, thank you for that one. Um, 
we'll maybe contact with you uh, separately after that. But we are going to wrap this up. Uh, thanks everyone for the awesome questions. Uh, feel free to reach out and contact us. Um, if you want to collaborate at all, we think there's lots of room for collaboration. If you have any questions, um, definitely feel free to contact us. Uh, look out for this on YouTube in a day or so, and I'm hoping maybe there'll be a more technical webinar, uh, which would be awesome. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to close this down. And all right.